gotta have coffee t-shirt on really hello everyone welcome to another video and in this video we're going to be looking at healthy gamer gg he also goes by the name of dr k because he is a licensed psychiatrist in the united states he's someone that puts out a lot of content on youtube and he actually has a lot of different platforms from what i've noticed and he's just essentially linking gaming to psychology something that i'm actually trying to do as well and i think that's really cool to see people out there really trying to get it and really trying to get after it. I have looked over some thumbnails, looked over some um, content titles and stuff like that, but I haven't really ever dived into any of his videos and I figured why not do so? Why not do so as a react review and as well as a breakdown in case there's certain parts of the argument or certain parts of the pitch that I find that may be missing because like I said, I have experiences in my own. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey y'all, today we're gonna talk about why therapy sucks for men. And that may sound kind of confusing because here I am a man, here I am a psychiatrist doing psychotherapy with men. So what on earth am I talking about? Why do I think therapy sucks for men? In my experience as a psychiatrist, I do actually believe that there are systemic biases that make it hard for men to engage in therapy. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what those systemic factors are, how we can understand them, and even how to overcome some of those factors and move toward. I like his setup. Looks peaceful. Towards more emotional health. If you're ready to take the next step on your mental health journey, check out Dr. K's guide. Oh, advertisement. It's an immersive resource. I'll let it play because I like what he's doing. Um, whether I agree with everything or not, doesn't really matter. It's the fact that he's providing himself as a platform and trying to be different and new about it. And I think that's, that's awesome to be that engaging with your community. That distills over 20 years of my experience laid out in a way that is tailored to your needs. So if you're ready to better understand your mind and take control of it, check out the link in the description below. So we have to start by understanding where this idea that talk therapy is the gold standard for treating mental illness comes from. So what we really need to understand is that the majority of patients in the history of psychotherapy have been women. About 60 to 70 percent of patients today who engage in psychotherapy are women. The other thing is that about 60 to 70 percent of therapists today are actually women. So I think what happened early on in psychiatry or psychotherapy is that the majority of people we were helping were women. And so when me as a doctor, when I look at 10 of my patients and I see, okay, so it looks like talking to people about their feelings on average is the most successful thing that I can do. But even though that's factually correct, I may not be taking into account that seven out of those 10 people are women. And maybe the people who are getting helped the most with talk therapy or talking about their emotions are actually women. And it's not just me that says this. If you actually look at the American Psychological Association's guidance for working with... So the main reason behind this, though, is also because men and women are brought up differently and women have a natural inclination to talk. But not only that, you also got to think about the increase of feminine men as well. So you can't really look at it as when women and men in today's society because there's a lot of feminine men and there's a lot more feminine men than there are masculine women. And so you can also make the argument that you are often dealing with more feminine people than masculine people. And with the with the idea of more and more feminine men being prevalent in today's society, this may still work on the feminine men because they are enacting those feminine traits and behaviors. And so that's another thing to think about in regards to the, the divide of why therapy works mostly for women and does not work or is not as effective because it's not universal. Biology is very prominent and a masculine man and a feminine woman cannot be treated in the same concept, in the same context, in the same realm or environment. It's, it, is, it is apples to oranges, day to night. Boys and men, they sort of point out a systemic bias in the way that we diagnose men and women. And that's a lot of the diagnoses that women get, like depression and anxiety, which by the way, women are about two to three times as likely to be diagnosed with that stuff. A lot of those diagnoses have to do with feelings and being able to articulate stuff. So, for example, major depressive disorder involves feeling sad when you're depressed, right? Makes sense. And then a lot of men are actually diagnosed with what we call externalizing disorders. Things like addictions or sociopathy or antisocial personality disorder. 
So these are disorders that involve behaviors. So I think they're sort of cluing us in on a really important idea, which is that when men feel something, they act on it as opposed to articulate it or talk about it. And if, and if we tunnel down into a little bit about how men deal with their emotions, we'll kind of see that this is true in general as well. So this is, all right, so externalizing disorders are not the same as acting on your emotions. Externalizing disorders, disorders exist because of the cowardice of the man. Now, the dialogue that you're going to hear me use isn't for the sensitive. I'm, I'm going to put that now and I'm going to make that very plain. People who have externalizing disorders are often people that run from their issues by engaging in other things to distract from those issues. Now, the reason why I use the term coward is because anyone who cannot face the monsters that exist does not currently have the bravery or courage to face those monsters. That's not to say that uh, that is an impossibility, but uh, that is to say that in that time, you are more fearful than you are courageous. And that in it, its own definition is a coward. Now, if, if the label hurts or harms people, that is a problem in itself, and it's just you need to understand that that is not to say that cowardice is your endpoint, but that is where you are. And if we're humble enough, we know that that's where we are, and we know how to what the next step is if we're humble. Because if you're a man, an emotion is a problem to be solved, not something to be talked about, right? So think about like if you get bullied on the playground and you feel ashamed of yourself, and people call you a fat kid and beat you up. That isn't something you talk about. In fact, if you go and cry to mommy or cry to the teacher, you're actually treated worse. You're taught that articulating problems and talking to people is cause for punishment. Instead, what you're supposed to do if you're a man is fix the problem. So, all right, so real quick, bullying, here's, here's a hot take. Bullying is the lack of preparation provided by parents for their child. Essentially, you allowed the naivety of your child to continue in thinking everyone is going to act in the manner that you're going to act, and no one is ever going to enact evil in their own little world as they develop. And I think that reason why bullying is so traumatic for a lot of kids is because parents don't actively prepare their children. And for those that don't know, socialization process is most impactful from the ages of four to 10. People that think that you can instill values from four to 10 are impossible. It's just like, no, that's actually a critical period of development. That's when you incorporate values. And so that's where bullying kind of comes into play. The second thing about boys talking, boys often talk to their mothers, I think more often than not, or at least more often than people would like to think. And the big difference there is because women often speak of their issues and they kind of find that sense of comfort. But for boys, it's a little different because granted, there are people that are going to talk to you. There are. Your mom will talk to you, but you know, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have that sense of reflection of, oh, this bothers you and I can tell. And if they're not the overbearing and over sheltering type they're the next question that's going to follow that dialogue or that conversation is what are you going to do about it? Because you are a boy. And if you care at all for what that boy is going to become, you're going to start approaching that child with a dialogue of when you're a man, this is, this is your problem to fix. So what are you going to do about it? And the idea of punishing is, yeah, and the idea of punishment is just, I don't, I don't really agree with that because that's not necessarily what happens. It's just boys don't find that sense of peace through talking about it because the problem continues, whereas women are a little more emotional in, in their regard and in their pitch. So they find a little more comfort in, in that sense of emotional release, so to speak. Whereas men still have this problem because that bullying concept is a sense of trespass on their own confidence and respect for themselves. So it's a little more on the masculine side than it is on the feminine side. Get ripped, learn martial arts, and the next time they talk, I'm going to teach them who's boss. And so if you sort of think about it, the solution to an internal feeling, feeling ashamed, is to take an action and change the circumstances that make me feel that way. If I'm feeling ashamed because I don't have a job and I don't have any money. Kind of stopping a lot in this short little span. But another thing that, that I noticed in this pitch was that when it comes down to, to boys, you know, as you said, through their process of having, being able to solve that problem, 
and showing them who's boss. It's actually, you know, you go to places where they foster development. If you're going to learn martial arts, you're you're not just learning martial arts. And I think a lot of people that don't know anything about martial arts or don't really understand the concepts behind it is that when you go to martial art establishments or you learn a variation of fighting, you're also learning the values that is instilled in those arts or by those coaches and people. And when you learn those things, you're also developing on a dimension of maturity that is beyond a, a physical scale. You're not just becoming some person that fights. You're becoming somebody that can avoid fights and be peaceful because by establishing a new form of aggression and violence for you, you live your life a little more respectfully. And kind of like Jordan Peterson said in regards to establishing the monster in you, by becoming this monster that you can control, you yourself display a sense of presence that is less likely to be bullied. That in, its sense, in itself solves the problem. To say that you need to enact revenge is actually a very immature way of externalizing those behaviors. And that's actually going down a bad side. And I can kind of see where that gets bad. And maybe that's his point. You know, maybe that is his point. What should I do about that? Should I go cry to mommy about how I don't have a job or don't have money? Should I cry to my girlfriend about how I'm broke all the time? No. If you're a man, you need to man the fuck up, go out there, get a job and start <laughs> making money. If you're feeling bad in here as a man, what we're taught is you're supposed to go fix the problem out there. And this also manifests in men's reluctance to engage in couples count. Like I said, by placing yourself in, in, in communities of growth, you're going to be much more than what you were when you started. If you care to see yourself as the nothing that entered that place of growing, trust me, you're going to become something else on the other end that no longer sees the issue you initially entered that place for as a problem because the, the growth and process is going to solve what that problem was all on its own. It's like so oftentimes, if you're in a relationship, and I'm assuming a heteronormative relationship for a second, and you know your wife or your girlfriend says, hey, I think we need to go see a counselor, oftentimes men will be reluctant to engage in that. And if you actually look at the research for why men are reluctant, what you discover is it's not that they're trying to put their head in the sand or they're avoiding a problem or anything like that. They actually feel outgunned in therapy. They feel like when they go to a couple's counselor, my partner is so much better at understanding and articulating their feelings that they can sort of make their case better than I can. And when the therapist tries talking to me, like I just say, I don't know a lot or I'm not sure, like I don't know how to. That's because women have a more, much more different upbringing in regards to their, their pitches of conversation. I guess maybe I said that in a long way. The point is, is that Women have been rewarded for their ability to express themselves. They have received active and positive attention on their ability to express themselves. As they've grown up, think when, you know, a, a little girl is crying, you know, she's more comforted than when the boy was that young and making the same mistake and how he was comforted. So he, the boys, as they grow up, and, and obviously this is a little bit of bias in regards to societal roles, maybe, but when the boy grew up, they didn't receive that active attention or that positive reinforcement as much as the girl does. So the girl, as she grew up, learned this works. So I'm going to learn how to talk out my problems even more. The boy that didn't receive that treatment isn't going to. Another thing about his, his regard to this research example is that this is a bit of a response bias. And essentially what that means is it's not gauging the people that aren't going to this counseling, right? There's a lot of a there's a lot of successful relationships out there that do not go to these forms of counseling because they learn the demographic, or the, not the demographic, but they learn the structure of their own home on their own. The, the development that these two reach in their relationship is so successful and so impactful that is not necessarily required. And no, no matter what the fuel was for that, they were successful in establishing a better form of the relationship. And so the success stories that didn't require therapy aren't in this category that he's mentioning. So you're kind of working with essentially the 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 other side and where, where relationships typically start to fail considering that they are in therapy. And he's saying that the man often says that he doesn't know because he didn't grow up with the reinforced implication to talk out his feelings. And that's mainly because it's not because he doesn't know. It's not because it's emotional intelligence and men are stupid, or at least I hope that's not his narrative. It's 
the sense of discounting. This problem isn't big enough for me to mention. And the reason why that exists is because men are often more egotistical and prideful in this regard. To, to, to be the complainer, right? No man who is seeking active forms of his own masculinity is going to say that he has a problem that he needs to talk about. And so there's a huge, there's a huge issue in this explanation because he's saying that it's because they don't know. It's just like, no, they know. They know. I think a lot of men know their problems. I think most men know their problems. This is not anecdotal. It's the fact that they just don't want to talk about it. They don't find that problem significant enough to take up people's time in regards to talking about it because that is not how society has depicted men, masculine men, men who do not want to be a burden to others because society has taught them that as men, they're supposed to carry these burdens and they're supposed to be, develop themselves along a, a sense of journey where they're strong enough to carry these things and then lead others to carry these things. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Someone's asking me to play basketball, but I don't know how to dribble. And so what men actually feel like in couples counseling is that they don't know how to effectively communicate. So imagine a situation where you're like going into a court of law and there's a judge there and your wife makes her case, right? She says, hey, Alok is neglectful. He doesn't appreciate me. I do so much for him. And I know he works hard, but he's really short with me sometimes and it really hurts and I feel really underappreciated. And then as a man, how do I respond to this? I don't speak the language of emotions. Judge, And so as a dude, you're like, you don't know how to communicate in the way that therapists like. So men literally feel outgunned to engage in things like couples therapy. That's a fair statement because like I said, there's a, there's a feminine shift in therapeutic delivery that does not fit a masculine character. I think that's not, obviously that's not what he said. I think that's my own theoretical approach, but it's along the lines of what he's saying. And that's because we as men communicate our emotions in a different way. So my favorite example of how men communicate differently is the negative expression of a positive affection. So when we like someone and we're proud of one of our homies or our bros, we don't say that to them, right? In fact, what we do is we kind of dog them about it. If my friend has been single for a while after a bad breakup and starts dating someone else and I feel really proud and good about that, I don't say, hey friend, I'm really proud of you and I'm proud that you've been able to find someone who sees the lovable qualities within you that I see. I'm proud that you found someone who treats you the way that I think you deserve to be treated who loves you for who you are in the way that I love you for who you are. In the history of- Which is nothing wrong with that pitch, but I feel like he's gonna take a different direction with it. Of humanity, I do not think that sequence of words has ever been spoken by a single man. That's not what we say. What do we say? We say, bruh, GG noob, you're whipped. I guess we'll never see you again. And we're smiling the whole time. We're not like, why don't you text me anymore? I know you haven't been texting me. I feel hurt. Instead, what we do is we actually dog on this guy, right? We're like, we call him whipped and we call him a wuss and we call him like, we say all these negative things, right? Like, oh, where's the apron strings? We'll say all this like misogynistic crap. But the whole time we're like expressing appreciation and smiling at him. All uh, right. So uh, what he called it a, what was it? A negative expression of a positive affection, I believe is what he called it. So here's the thing. This demographic that he's talking about are essentially the demographic of men that haven't developed along their own dimension enough to know the difference of effective feedback and knowing that there's a there's an illusion of toughness, right? I think a lot of good or or a lot a lot of men that have traveled along that sense of self development know how to reach their peers and their counterparts and and the people they care for. To, to have that dialogue, I get what he's saying. I think it's a it's it's for basically most, you know, growing, growing boy to men, you know, demographic, you know, whether they're in their late teens or young adulthood. I think this this applies to a lot of them because, you know, that this is how they communicate to, to one each other, to one another. This is what they, they feel the need to still display toughness amongst other men because they feel that's more important than not. And I, I get it. However, that is not the the end point. And I think that the reason why that exists as a, dial, as, a, as a narrative is because men do not understand what true toughness is. They don't understand what real resiliency is. 
they don't understand what real confidence is. And so in a, in a false attempt at retaining their toughness, this is the narrative they're going to use. They're going to use this, these negative expressions of positive affections because they haven't established a, a genuine and authentic sense of masculinity in themselves. So they, so they feel the need to sound like this when they say good things because they don't know how to sound good and remain good without it. And I think that's kind of like, a, there's a term for it, but it's kind of like a coping mechanism in a way. So men have this negative expression of a there positive affection. Yeah. When we feel good about something, we can't just say that, right? Because that's not what we were taught. Instead, what we have to do is we have to insult the person that we're proud of. That's not how psychotherapy works, right? So if this is my mode of communication, I go see my therapist and my therapist is proud of me. They don't say, hey, fucker, you got a job. You suck. I guess you're not going to be coming to therapy anymore because you ain't got this time because you got all this, this work to do. You know, screw you. That's not what your therapist says. In fact, we're trained to say the opposite. So the way that we're trained to speak in therapy is, first of all, don't speak very much, right? Don't solve problems. Just sit there and listen and ask this person lots. And so the people that may look at these these little points that he's speaking on that is pretty actively true for therapy. It's not to, it, I'm, I'm sure people are going to ask, well, then what is therapy for? It's it's. Like I said before, th therapy is more of a, of a process and a tool applied to that process. It's for people that can't actively see how much of an issue or a monster it may exist, or maybe elaborating on points that they're a little more blind to. It's not necessarily to, to identify a problem, because the problem is typically very obvious. The, the problem, because you're the one, it's just that people aren't humble enough to address these problems and and therapy can therapy can use to can be used to peel back those layers in a sense to to really see what's going on some questions that they're gonna the how and why not the what to say i don't know to how do you feel about that how does that make you feel i don't know well how does that make you feel i don't know and so then if you're a dude and you go to therapy i think this goes back to that to that concept of failing their own sense of genuine masculinity because they, they, they feel that a man can't say what he feels, which is a lie, right? That's toxic masculinity. A man can say if he, how he feels because he's confident in who he is as a man. And the ability, I, th I would argue that men feel just as much as women do. They're just not as expressive about it. And I think the key point that men need to learn, because this is a focal point around men, is establishing a sense of emotional resiliency and being adaptive and flexible to what you feel. That's not to say that you run from what you feel. That's not to say that you can't admit what you feel. That is to feel what you feel and then still operate on a sustainable function that this feeling does exist, accept it, sort it in its parts, and then move forward. You feel like an idiot, right? Because they're asking you all these questions. You're supposed to know what you feel, but you don't know. And that's because of the way that we've been taught about, about our emotions. The last thing to consider is that when it comes to emotional health, men are very physical with it. So even if I ask a dude, hey, like, you know, you're, it sounds like you got dumped. Tell me a little bit about how you feel. The dude may not be able to say, I feel unlovable. I'm full of fear that, that perhaps I, I won't be able to find a partner. I'm afraid that I'm fundamentally broken in some way that precludes me and maybe destines me to be alone for the rest of my life. That's not what dudes say. What dudes say is it felt like she ripped my heart out. It felt like she stomped on my balls. And if you say that as a dude, the other dudes will know exactly what you mean, right? Like we all know like, oh man, like, oh, it's not just ripped your heart out. It's also a stomp on the balls. The reason why his narrative is so consistent is because he knows that if you say stomped on your balls to other men, no matter how far along they are on their moral development or as their development as a man in general, they're going to understand that sentiment. Because if you, let's say you have someone that is developed and someone who isn't, right? And they're, they're, they're on different points along that dimension. The person that's farther along can be able to explain these things in a very articulative manner. It's not just a woman thing, believe it or not. Explaining those those immense and, and, you know, deep concepts to someone who's not that far along that dimension is they're going to get lost. They're going to get lost in your explanation. And that's why it's, it's almost safer to use the narrative that he's talking about because you know, it's universal. Not a lot of men are along that, that are, that are beyond that age group that I spoke on before 
have reached that sense of dimension. I felt that, man. The last time I got dumped, I found out my partner was cheating on me. Felt like she kicked me in the nuts, dude. I know exactly how you feel. That's how we talk. We're very physical in nature. The other thing is if you talk to men about who support each other, right, and they say, if you get dumped, what's the first thing you should do? Hit the gym, baby. And that's where we may assume that there, that this relates to confidence, that if you start working out, you get buff, then you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I'm so sexy. But we don't even acknowledge for a moment that there may be a physiological aspect to improve your mood. The one thing I'm going to say to this, and it's kind of repetitive of what I said before, you go to places that inspire the growth that you are seeking. If the gym means that you are working on your physical self, it's also because you have the discipline to work on your physical self. So that's a two for one. And a lot of people that don't work on their physical selves don't understand the emotional and mental capability they reach through physical work. And it has a lot to do with you know, certain martial arts, they apply the same exact sentiment is that through the mastery of self and physical self, can you can you work on your mental and emotional self? And it's just it's just a route. You start with the physical and then you move up into the more complex, disorganized versions of yourself, which is often the mental and emotional. And I think that that's where a lot of scientists kind of get it wrong because they there's not a whole lot of scientists that really dive into martial arts or really dive into the realm and effectiveness of it. There's a lot of research on it, but no actual, not a lot of, not a lot of applicants that really go through that journey because if they do, they have a different pitch on the other side when they evolve. And one of the biggest mistakes that I think we've made in the field of psychotherapy is that we've separated out the mind from the body. Whereas if you look at modern science, we know that anxiety is not just an emotion it's not just in your mind that emotions have yeah i mean it's the fact that we separated was kind of a mistake i think that he's essentially saying that it should have never been it's all the same thing it's all just this linear concept physical ramifications that anxiety can induce diarrhea and change the rate of your peristalsis anxiety activates your sympathetic nervous system and reduces blood flow to places like your stomach and increases blood flow to other parts of your body so we know that emotions are actually very physiological in nature. So why is it as a society that we've kind of gotten on this track of simply talking about them instead of acting physically? And a lot of the men that I've worked with, I've sort of noticed that this physical component is way more important than the talking component, at least compared to the women that I've worked with. Just to give you all a simple example, I find that the men in my office need hugs way more than the women. Now, there are a lot of complications to that. There's a gender dynamic, right, between me and the woman where maybe the woman doesn't feel as comfortable to hug me. Maybe I don't feel as comfortable to hug the woman. So I'm not saying that that's like a statement of fact. But what I've noticed is that like hugging men, the, the patients in my office who are dudes, leads to like a lot more emotional healing and sometimes tears and all this kind of stuff and like more dick jokes after we're done, right? So there, there's something very physical about the way that men deal with their emotions. I think the point here also is that how often do men actually receive physical warmth? And in comparison to women, how often do women receive it? You got to imagine that women receive physical companionship far more than men do. And that's not to say that, oh, that means men need to be hugged all the time. No, but I think the male loneliness epidemic is a perfect example of what has been failing for men because the higher we have a, a, a lack of accountability in women, the more men are kind of ostracized in, in that regard and the, and the less, or, or I guess the, the more difficult it is for them to find their place. And I think that's what has a lot to do with, you know, them being open to warmth regardless. And I think that has a lot to do with it. And so if we assume all of this is true, what does this mean for you as a dude? So I know this sounds kind of weird, but the first thing that I'd recommend is that you actually seek psychotherapy if you're struggling in some way. And that may sound weird because you said, Dr. K, there's a systemic bias. Yeah, but it's still the best evidence-based treatment that we have for dealing with mental illness. Medication is just as good, by the way. And another thing we need to keep in mind. That was his little psychiatric pitch. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that was. Mind is that the Jugs are good. There are randomized controlled trials on many types of psychotherapy, which show that they are equally effective for men and women. So it's not like psychotherapy works. It's just that if you're engaging in psychotherapy as a man, there may be a couple of things that we can arm you with to really make that psychotherapy really worthwhile. 
I think uh, therapy is for anyone, no matter what, no matter what range you are or where where you are on your own path and journey or your process. It doesn't matter. I think that if you've never experienced therapy or variations of it, you'd be surprised as to what you can learn about yourself or what you can learn to master about yourself just by having that sense of exposure. If you're not someone that believes in it, that's fine. Expose yourself. I think that the less we expose ourselves to, the less we're prepared for chaos because chaos is all about being exposed to the unknown. And the more we hide from that, we're not really doing ourselves justice, nor are we doing our development justice. And I think that that's always a good experience to have. So the first recommendation that I have is that you see at least three psychotherapists, or at least you see at least three before you give up on therapy. If you love the first one, then stick with them. And so a lot of psychotherapy is about fit, and it may just be hard to find someone who's able to communicate with you in a way that is helpful. So a couple of things that I would recommend, some language that you can use if you go to psychotherapy. So the first is just simply let your therapist know, hey, I'm not really aware of what I feel all the time, and I'm not very good at articulating my feelings. Because oftentimes therapists will say, how do you feel? And as dudes, we don't know how to answer that. So just be transparent with them at the beginning. Another thing that I'd recommend is that y'all check out this idea of normative male alexithymia, which is this idea that men are, by default, it's normative, so it's like most men are colorblind to their internal emotional state. So check out our video on alexithymia if y'all want to. And then you can even tell your... your. I might have to look at that video offline. All right, so here, here's the thing. Now, it could just be my perspective, my opinion, my bias in regards to what men are capable of. But when I, when I see someone say, hey, go in with a label, I disagree. I think that you are limiting your own potential of what you're trying to expose yourself to by placing a label on you that you don't fully understand or comprehend because this is a term that is used very actively, it seems, throughout his experience and maybe the experience of other psychiatrists, when in reality, there's a whole new perspective, the one that I kind of put forth that men just aren't humble enough to put forth these monsters that they hide, or at least these, these monsters that they don't want to own in regards to not really wanting to talk about it, not wanting to burning up, burning other people for it. And I, like I, like I said, there's a lot of men that I've talked to, and this is not anecdotal. You can kind of look to your left and right and be like, "Hey, do, do you do? Are you aware of the stuff that bothers you?" And they're they're probably going to say, "Yeah." Or if they don't want to admit anything, they're going to say, "Well, I don't know." Right? <laughs> they're going to use exactly the narrative that he's talking about because to say "I don't know" is safer than to put your neck out there as someone who isn't tough. Right? That someone who isn't masculine because people have the delusion that that's what masculinity is, is that nothing bothers you. It's just like, you'd be surprised that the toughest of men are actually people who experience the widest range of emotion because they know how to filter it. They have grown so accustomed to their own person and their own mind and their own feelings that they know how to work through anything. They're so flexible, they're so resilient, and they're so adaptive. That is with exposure you need to feel things to learn how to work through it and people that hide from that are going to be more likely to say i don't know than to be the person that says yes i have these problems and for a long time i just haven't wanted to burden anybody with it because i'm the provider i'm the protector no one has time for my issues i need to solve other people's issues a therapist that hey i'm concerned that i'm a little bit alexithymic so you're signaling to them that you may not be able to participate in therapy in a default way. The next thing that you can do is ask your therapist to change their style a little bit if it isn't working for you. So you can tell them, hey, I've noticed that you're really quiet. And then you kind of ask these questions like, how do you feel over and over and over again? And then I keep answering, I don't know. Can you try to be a little bit more active or offer a little bit more guidance instead of being quieter and asking only open-ended questions? Can you help me understand stuff or guide me in some way? And some therapists may feel really uncomfortable with that. They may turn that around into a question. Why do you feel like you need more guidance? <laughs> I don't know, because this doesn't seem to be helping very much. So you can just ask them to change their style a little bit. And the third thing that you can do if number one and number two don't work is after two or three sessions, I would just go to them and say, hey, I don't feel like I'm actually getting a whole lot out of this therapy. So you seem to be asking certain questions that I have difficulty answering, and I'm hoping that you can recommend a different therapist 
Agreed. who's a little bit more active can offer a little bit more guidance or yes. asks questions in a way that can help me understand my emotions better. Absolutely. And I know that this sounds mortifying. Oh my God, as a dude, why would I ever do that? As anyone, as any patient, why would I ask to see a different therapist? It means that I don't think they're good. As a man, why are you concerned? I guess that's, that's my pitch, right? As a man, why are we afraid of confrontation to begin with? If we know that this isn't actively producing the outcome that we sought, then we need to change things in order to maximize that concept and that belief. Who cares if this is like a feeling thing for the professional? If they're a professional, it shouldn't you sh it shouldn't really cross your mind. It shouldn't occur to you. If it's if it's a matter of like I said, this person's used to dealing with women, maybe, you know, and this is what they've learned throughout their career to work, that's not gonna help you. And so it's okay to admit that this person's experience isn't fitted to your path and your process. That is a personal decision to stick with someone even though they're not helping you. Right? And and we can't we can't avoid our own we can't we can't postpone our path because the inadequacy of another. And it doesn't mean that they're not good. It just means that exactly. they're not really helping you very much. No. Or at the minimum, you can have a conversation about what's working and what isn't, and then hopefully y'all can work through that stuff. So I, as a therapist, actually don't feel, I mean, I feel bad in some ways, but I'm really <laughs> grateful for all of my patients who have come to me and said, hey, Dr. K, this is not working. Because it's a learning point. It's a huge learning point for any professional that's actively trying to seek their own professional development. If someone's telling me like, hey, this isn't working, it's it's a reality check to the professional, right? Like, wow, I, I you know, this has worked for so many people. This is, And if they don't take that as a, an opportunity to learn, then that's really a short-sighted professional and they should probably, you know, not do it anymore. Because then one of two things happen. One is either we work on it and then we actually make a breakthrough of some kind and now we're really jiving exactly. together. Or I recommend that the person go see someone else. And what's my duty as a doctor or someone's duty as a therapist? There it is. He's about to, he's about to tell you. He's about to... It's to help the person, not help yep. the person myself. It means giving that person whatever kind of help they need. There you go. So oddly enough, I'm still recommending that y'all try psychotherapy because it is still an evidence-based, very effective approach. The other thing to consider, though, is that a lot of emotions live in our body. And as men, sometimes we need to do more bodily stuff. So there are studies that show that Tai Chi and yoga, for example, are effective treatments for a lot of things like mood disorders or anxiety or things like that. So adding a... There's also research and because... I... I, I find it interesting that he's avoiding martial arts because he mentioned it in a negative light in the beginning. And I think that's why he's avoiding martial arts. But martial arts and physical bodily improvement or muscular development is has the same impact as these other forms on a much more impactful scale considering the confidence and self-respect of men. To, to be 100% transparent. There's a lot of research in this regard. There's a lot of research for uh, children who utilized martial arts instead of imaginary, imaginative play, which is when two kids get together and they kind of mess around, they imagine stuff. They, they swapped out that theory with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for example, and it was more effective and more impactful with them as kids across the board in that regard. And I think that's, it matters. All the tools exist. You can try it. And people that are a little insecure about getting into martial arts, I'm telling you, a good a good martial arts gym, whether it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or, or Gracie or 10th Planet or Muay Thai boxing, I'm going to tell you right now, the, the coaches and instructors, they have to be as humble as possible. They cannot be these intimidating monsters. They know that if they were that, no one would enter their gym. No one's going to want to go talk to the, to, to the guy that's acting too tough, right? They're going to be these humble human beings. And there's this huge delusion and, and bias in, the, in regards to these people. Uh, maybe because I, I myself have taught. But I'm going to tell you right now, I have, I have had to work on my own ability to be approached on a grand scale because of that belief. And it, it's something that I worked on to the point where now I am more approachable. Now I am more manifold and people love to address these problems with me. And that was always something that I love doing and hence my current direction of my career.
a physical component to your emotional health is very, very helpful. The other thing to consider is that there's a range of new and kind of in vogue things called somatic therapies. So these are therapies that incorporate the body in some way. So good examples of this are EMDR or EFT, which is the emotional freeing technique or tapping. So when I first encountered these studies about 10 or 15 years ago, and I used to sort of, my area of interest was evidence-based complementary alternative medicine, I thought all this stuff was like kind of BS, right? <laughs> so it's like the idea behind tapping is that your emotions are stored in your body and that you can tap on certain parts to free emotions. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. This is all BS. Some spiritual and it turns stuff. out that over the last decade or so, there have been some studies that actually show that this is a pretty effective technique. We're not really 100% sure. You know, the, the studies aren't super high quality, but there's more and more evidence that stuff that is not classically effective may be effective. And specifically that a lot of somatic therapies seem to be gaining a lot of weight and gaining a lot of interest. So I encourage y'all to seek out more bodily oriented kind of evidence-based techniques. And the last thing that I just want to share with y'all is that I've seen that across the globe, there's a lot more men's work kind of going on. And this isn't psychotherapy, but it's just sort of groups of men will get together and will participate in all kinds of either communication or even like some sorts of like physical rituals or like taking hikes. But there's sort of this very like physical component to, to their emotional health, which they all sort of get together and do. So I can't speak to specific things like that. I'm the uh, I think the main charging element to the the men's groups is mainly because fatherlessness is a growing epidemic of its own. Missing fathers in the home is a long aching gap that men need to overcome and a lot don't. I promise you so many people fail in this area and, and it, it diverts to poor forms of masculinity It diverts to to poor modeling it, it there's a lot of issues here and i think that men's groups became so such an astounding finding is because that grew as a problem because if you go back it wasn't very common you had like boy scouts and like you know uh men's uh, gentlemen's clubs and stuff like that or or uh, different different sport affiliates but it was never as adamant as it is now and it's this, it's this huge thing. You can literally Google it. It's, it's, it's a lot of little organizations and clubs because fatherlessness is just such a predominant force. I'm just sort of pointing that out as a trend. So at the end of the day, I know it sounds kind of weird, but I do think that therapy sucks for men for a lot of reasons. Some of that has to do with the way that we're raised. Some of that has to do with the way that psychotherapy was developed. And so as men, we sort of really need to think a little bit about how can I become emotionally healthy? So I definitely give therapy a shot, but go in with some of these disclaimers in mind. Go in understanding that you may not be perfectly suited to this, that you're stepping onto the basketball court, but you don't necessarily know how to dribble. And so just recognize that and ask your therapist for help. And the second thing to consider is that especially as men, a lot of our emotions live in our bodies. We may need to leverage our bodies or do some kind of bodily work to really help us achieve emotional health. Well, pretty decent video. Um, he knows how to construct his information very well. He doesn't miss a beat. I, I honestly, I wish I could apply some of that same rhythm, rhythm to some of my videos because there's times where I'm a little all over the place, but obviously he has worldly, he has a lot of experience within his craft. The disclaimer that I'm gonna apply to this video and to therapy as a whole, first to this video is, you may not be the demographic of men that he's trying to reach, point blank. You may be further along your developmental path than the men that he is trying to reach. And you may find that his videos are very shallow in that regard, because if you are, if you are farther along that path, they're going it, to, it's going to sound like a lot of shallow content. It really will. And, and that's, that's not to say that it is bad content. It's just, it's not for you where you are and you can keep trucking along in your path to where you're going and maybe seek something that is a little a little more applicable to you and your masculinity, confidence, and self-respect as a man, especially working on your sense of establishing a sense of controlled violence for you. Disclaimer for the sense of therapy is, and, and my, my belief as to why it is currently hard for men is because therapy is starting to tailor it as a universal tool to both genders, no matter what. The issue with that is that it is very successful in treating feminine people but people seeking masculinity 
or establishing realms of masculinity for themselves is going to be far less effective and damn near unreachable to these people because the components used and the tools used doesn't enforce those concepts of masculinity and it makes it harder to reach those people and they don't they're not equipped to deal with those situations or those 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 concepts and that's why psychiatrists like him have a belief that men just don't know not realizing that men know it's just a burden that they don't want to unload on anyone because they feel the need to carry it as if, as if that is a that is a complete measure of their strength as a man because that is their responsibility that is a role maybe there's something they got taught when they were younger they they did have that father and and he he never complained about anything he's just, he was just quiet all the time which is a problem in itself men should be able to navigate their issues if they need to and then be able to break it down, break things down in their parts. And I think that that's why kind of why therapy's going in that direction, because there is a lot more female therapists. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the way that men and women deal with issues is significantly different on average. Women can't understand how men deal with issues, no matter how much empathy is applied. And you can look at a lot of textbooks. There's a lot of textbooks that tell you what empathy is and how it looks. But there's no real textbook on how to develop you further along an empathic dimension. And what I mean by that is that there's no book out there that shows you how to believe in the empathy you are displaying. And with that regard, it's because we are comparing apples to oranges. Women cannot understand the way that men deal with their issues because women were brought up differently naturally and it might be just a biological some people will say it's a societal uh societal kind of intervening in that but the one thing i'll say is that we have a biological tendency to protect or preserve weaker variations of ourselves so men naturally protect women they naturally foster themselves to for women and and there's that sense of chivalry that has always existed it still exists it's just now it's kind of being attacked because women feel women are so prideful that they can't accept any form of assistance or help because it, it to them it sounds like the men saying that they can't do it and it's just like no it's just that natural biological tendency to assist and help doesn't mean that we don't think you can it means that we as protectors or providers want to we want to make things a little easier for you physically because we understand the emotional burdens that women may carry especially as mothers so that's my little pitch and that's my little disclaimer for the video as well as what i think in regards to therapy not being as effective for men appreciate for anyone that watched the video i appreciate for anyone that stuck with me all the way to the end please comment like and subscribe and if you dislike the video then dislike it and you'll never see me again also comment on the bottom for any follow-on comments any follow-on perspectives questions that you may have of me or just your own thoughts in general i always look to seek out conversations and i believe that anyone that can come humbly can receive something respectfully and that's just the environment that i try to push with that being said i'll go ahead see you next time